Hello. Welcome. We are glad that you are joining us on this Palm Sunday morning. Um, and so um, I don't know how you feel about the rain. It's cold rain, but I'm glad that we are getting some moisture. So um, we're excited for that. Um, just a couple of announcements this morning as we get going. Now, if you're a first time guest with us, if you would do me a favor, um, there are connect cards in the chairs in front of you. Um, and if you would fill that out and you can come find me after service and I would love to catch your name and meet you. Um, and that's just a way for us to get some information about you so we can get you information about us. Uh, get you some information about our church and who we are and the different types of things that we have going on here at Whiting Christian Church. Um, and so and those can also be used for prayer requests. If anybody has anything they would like prayers for, um, they can write that down and uh, we would love to pray for you today or get it on the prayer chain to have others praying for you. Um, and so yes, some other things announcement-wise, uh, we still have the sign-ups for VBS. Um, if you would like to help with either the decorations or uh, help on VBS week, um, and registration is also open uh, for VBS. If you would like to register kiddos for VBS, you can go ahead and start doing that. Um, and the sooner the better, just because then we have an idea for a shirt order, because we want to be able to make sure that kiddos who order shirts can get them on time. Um, and so that's coming up. Um, tonight, um, we are heading down to Ottawa uh, to watch the Passion of the Christ movie at the theater. Um, there in Ottawa at 7 o'clock uh, will be the showing. Um, it's free admission. Um, and so please come and invite anybody that you would like to come watch this movie. Um, uh, parents, if you don't know, it is an R-rated movie, just a heads up. Um, and um, we had Jonah Wiggs last week found out that it is a movie, you know, in the original languages. And so there's a lot of subtitles and that just blew his mind. Like, well, I have to read. Um, but so just, just a heads up, if you don't like subtitles, there will be subtitles. Um, but no, it is, um, it's such an impactful movie. Um, and it is such a wonderful reminder during this time of year um, of Jesus, our Savior, and what he did for us. And so um, please come join us tonight at 7 down at Honor the Movie Theater. Um, they'll have the concession stand open. You can buy some snacks there. Um, and please feel free to invite people. Um, please, please, please invite. And I, you know, I sent a text out the other day. Uh, but again, this is as we talk about the one in our life, the one that we want to go and find, the person that we want to show Jesus, um, these are one, some of the wonderful opportunities that you have to invite that person to something. Um, to get them uh, to learn a little bit about who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And so that's an amazing opportunity uh, to invite them to something. And so please consider that as well. But that'll be tonight at 7. Um, this coming Friday, we are going to have a prayer service from 6.30 to 7.30 on Good Friday um, to recognize Jesus dying on the cross and, and to spend some time in worship and, and um, you know, as Easter is about resurrection, we do want to talk about uh, the cross as well and, um, and, and realize what Jesus did for us again. Um, and so we'll have that prayer service on Friday. Again, be uh, uh, inviting people to that. We have cards um, out in the back that you can grab to use for invite cards. Um, and then next Sunday is Easter. Uh, so we are greatly excited. Sorry, I need, my tone needs to match my excitement. We are greatly excited for Easter. Um, we are looking forward to Easter. Uh, there will be no Sunday school, but we will have breakfast at 9 a.m. with some egg bakes and some pastries and whatnot, and I think some fruit. Um, and then we will have service at 10. Um, and so again, please be inviting people to Easter service here. We are looking forward to that, and we have cards for that in the back as well. And so if you would like um, to be inviting people and you want you know, to be able to give them something, we've got those in the back for you that you can give. Um, and then the last thing is our family meeting um, that's coming up on April 7th. Um, and so this is to talk about some things with the church, um, getting some roles that we need filled, filled, um, and, and different things of that nature. Some emphasis that we want to have in this next year as we uh, look at 2024. Uh, and, and so we uh, are inviting, uh, well, not inviting, because that's the thing I've been saying, right? We're not inviting family meeting. Uh, if you're a part of the family, we'll see you there. Um, but if you would like to sign up, because again, uh, we're catering this meal. We want to get numbers for them. Um, in, on the table in the back, just outside the doors, um, is the sign up for that. If you could just let us know if you're coming, um, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, and so, but with that, that's all of my uh, 
uh, announcements, I think. Yes, I'm good. Woo. Um, so let me go ahead and pray, um, and we will get started in our worship this morning. Uh, dear God, I thank you for today. Um, I thank you for your son Jesus, um, who entered Jerusalem all those years ago, um, that he rode in on that donkey as king. Um, and, and that is such an amazing thing because Jesus knew exactly what was coming. Uh, he knew exactly what was coming at the end of that week, uh, but he still, he rode in uh, knowing that he was doing it with the intention of saving us, um, that he was doing it for each and every one of us who sit here this morning, and so we are thankful for our king who rode in uh, to that city. Um, God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The king reigns forever and comes to redeem us. His strength will carry us. He is here, humble but mighty, of sorrow and splendor, entering Jerusalem to save us. He is here. The crowd chants and shouts, proclaiming his reign, honoring the one who overcomes. He is here. He left his throne in heaven, needs no one to guard him. He is mighty and omnipotent. The King is here. In Him dwells all treasure. His throne is wisdom and knowledge. His name alone is exalted. The King is here. He makes everything new. The Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The creator of all things. The King is here. He brings no army wields the sword of the word. He needs no protection. The king is here. He who begins and he who finishes, he who fulfills, the king is here. The one who offers himself, the one who sacrifices it all, who came to usher in the kingdom of God. That king, the only king, our king, he is here. Let's celebrate him this morning. Won't you stand with me, White Christian Church? Good to have you here this morning. Raise the joyful noise in this house this morning. Amen. Here we go. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. Heart in the raging sea, my God, He holds a victory. Yeah, there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out Your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in.
someone you haven't seen in a little bit. We'll be back with you in one minute.
you seek me out how could i be lost when you have called me found you chase me down you seek me out how could i be lost when you have called me found lift it up you chase me down Seek me out. How could I be lost when you have called me found? And like a tidal wave, crashing over me, rushing in to meet me here. Your love is fierce, like a Father God, we praise you this morning, and in our hearts we have a sense of gratitude, Lord, that even though that in one week with your ministry, Lord, that you would go from being celebrated as Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Lord, we know that on that Good Friday that you would die a most gruesome death on our behalf. Lord, we recognize that even today, what happened so many years ago, Lord, what even happens today, Lord, you intended for your good. You intended for our good, that we get to celebrate in relationship with you, in communion with you, in absolute unity with you. Lord, help us to continue singing from our hearts this morning about our sense of absolute, eternal, forever gratitude to you this morning, Lord, and we continue to praise you in song this morning. It's his name, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. my words fall short I've got nothing new how could I express all my gratitude I could sing these songs as I often do but every song I So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. So all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing heart.
your soul Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord So come on my soul Don't you get shy on me Lift up your soul Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord. So come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Good morning. For today's communion meditation, I'd like to read a uh, meditation from the Christian Standard by Ed White. <clears throat> um, um, he uses the, the verse from Levitic, Leviticus 24, 5, and 6, and it says, and you shall take fine flour and bake 12 cakes with it, two-tenths of an ephah, shall be in each cake. You shall set them in two rows, six in a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord. So this is describing the tabernacle <coughs> of the Israelites constructed at Mount Sinai, and it had two rooms, uh, two holy rooms. The most holy place, or the holy of holies, symbolized the throne room of God. His throne was called the mercy seat, um, and it was the place from which the Lord sent out his mercy to the children of Israel. The other room was called the holy place. It was kind of like an antechamber. It was a waiting room where, it, where one would await the summons to enter the presence of the king. The two rooms were separated by a veil, and only the high priest went, into the, be, went beyond the veil into God's presence. He entered that room once each year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. When Jesus died for us, the temple veil was torn in two from top to bottom, and that symbolized the fact that God opened up his throne room to us. We have access to the Father because of what Jesus did, paying the penalty for our sins. The golden table in the holy place contained 12 loaves of face bread, or the bread of the presence, and that's what the the scripture uh, was referencing. It symbolized the fact that the 12 tribes of Israel were always before the face of God, always in his presence. The loaves were an offering to God from the people of Israel to acknowledge their understanding that they were always before him and that the blessings he provided were continual. That bread was the only offering that was never interrupted. It remained on the table for one week and was replaced with fresh loaves each Sabbath. Jesus is the bread of life. John 6, 35 and 48 reference that. He sustains us every day, both physically and spiritually. We are always before his face, always in his mind, always in his heart. He never leaves us or forsakes us. 
We come each week to this table of the Lord to acknowledge our continual dependence on him and to remember that our standing before the Father is based on the sacrifice he made in our behalf. We have fellowship with the Father because Jesus died to make it possible. Here we commune with God as we remember his blessed son, Jesus, who qualified us to enter his presence and to have fellowship with him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you um, thinking about the, the great sacrifice that, <clears throat> that Jesus made for us because of your love for us and because of his love for us. As we um, pause here and reflect upon the, the past week, help us to <clears throat> examine our lives and to um, think about how you can work in our lives and make us um, more effective <clears throat> in our service for you to others. We just praise you so much for the gift that you have given to us, allowing us to commune with you, to be in your presence. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your goodness. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we prepare to take up an offering, um, let's just go to the Lord and, and ask a blessing for this. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, again, we come to you, and, and uh, as we prepare to take up these gifts, we pray that, um, that we would give these monies cheerfully and that you would bless them and use them um, for the furtherance of your kingdom. Um, Lord, help us to help others through these gifts and to, to uh, <clears throat> make this church an effective witness um, for you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So I asked this as somewhat of a rhetorical question this morning, um, but has anyone ever uh, honestly been able to use the phrase, that went exactly the way I thought it would. Right? Has anyone, any show of hands, anybody ever been able to use that phrase? That went exactly the way I thought it was. Okay, good. I'm glad to see no hands because I would have called you a liar otherwise. Um, right? I, I don't know if there's ever been a time in my life where I could use that phrase honestly. And, and I mean anything. You know, last week I talked a little bit about handyman projects. Um, I consider only having to run to Baumgars three times in the middle of a project success, right? Like, if I only have to go to Baumgars again and again three times, okay, perfect, that project went well. Um, you know, and, and so it's just those things that you build in. Now, this includes, like, road trips. Uh, there's a reason I hate traveling. It's because tra nothing ever goes to plan when traveling, right? Uh, and so the simplest thing, right, if you want everything to go to plan when you're traveling, what, you, what do you do? 
don't travel. Just don't. <laughs> That's the easiest way for everything to go according to plan traveling. Uh, this includes cooking. You know that I am not a cook. I thought green fluff would go super well. Once again, that did not go the way I thought it would. <laughs> uh, I've messed up making frozen raviolis. Fun fact, if you boil them too long, all the cheese comes out. I learned that the hard way. And then what do you do? You're left with these cheeseless raviolis. Do I just throw everything away? Like, or no, I'm stuck eating this like, gross mush of pasta. Um, and so, and it, it kills me because I'm a person who likes plans. I do. I like plans. And the reason for that is because when there's a plan, I know what's coming. I know it's coming. It gives me this comfortability of, yeah, I, I know what's coming. But, you know, life, you don't get to know what's coming. <laughs> uh, and, and so a lot of times when something wouldn't go according to plan, when I, you know, like, man, that didn't go the way I thought it would, it would put me in such a poor mood, right? Like things already aren't going the way I thought they would, and now I'm, I'm grumpy too because it didn't go the way I thought it would. Uh, but the, the more this happens in my life, the more things don't go quite the way I think they should, uh, the more I come to grips with the idea that uh, the phrase that went exactly how I thought it would is just a myth. <laughs> it's just a myth. And, and I don't mean that we should become pessimistic about this. Of You know, I'm just going to set the bar really low, and then I don't have to worry about disappointment. You know, that's where some people take that of, uh, well, nothing's going to go to plan, so I'm just going to put the, the, you know, the bar really low, and so then when things go wrong, whatever. You know, I, I don't think we have to go that far, uh, but I bring this up today because we're going to be talking about seeking after the one. We're in this series talking about the one in our life, the person that we want to bring into a relationship with Jesus, and, and part of this is going to be seeking after them. So what does it look like to go after someone who is lost? And I think it's important to understand that this will rarely ever go the way that we think it will. We might come up with plans, we might come up with strategies and have thoughts of what might happen, but seeking the one will likely never go the way that you think it will. So what do we do about that? Do we just go in blind and hope for the best? <laughs> While we'll never know everything, I don't think we have to go in blind. There are ways that we can prepare for the unknown and there are ways that we can find peace when things don't go the way that we think they should. And so I want to look at our three parables in Luke 15 this morning and see what they tell us about the journey of finding the one. So if you want, you can turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 15. And we're going to look at our first parable, which is of the shepherd and his sheep. Let me read verses 3 through 4. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Okay, we're going to go on a small tangent, so bear with me. And by small tangent, I wrote small tangent when I had just gotten to this part of my sermon. And then as things go, it ended up being a larger tangent than I had originally thought. So I'm going to keep with the small tangent and, and just bear with me. Um, but over the last several years, uh, this parable of the lost sheep um, has become increasingly popular um, in, in our Christian world, and it's been used for a lot of different things. And, and a reason for this is because um, it's the theme passage for a worship song that has exploded into popularity over the last several years. Um, I think the song came out in 2018, so just feels like yesterday. It's six years ago now. Uh, goodness gracious. Um, and that would be the song, Reckless Love. A and you've probably heard this song, Reckless Love, but I'm not sure you're aware uh, that there is a fair amount of controversy that surrounds this song. Uh, and I want to address this a little bit and talk about it um, and, and give you my opinion. And as I get into this, um, I want to make it clear uh, that this is a secondary issue for me. Uh, this is a secondary issue for me, and, and I... You know, some people take things like this and they're like, no, we're divided on this. We can't see eye to eye. It doesn't bother me that much. Um, and so please understand that, you know, if once I'm done with this, you're like, Jed, you're overthinking this. You disagree with me. 
um, you know, that's fine. No hurt feelings. I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, but our parable um, pops up in the chorus of this song. So let me read this chorus of this song. Uh, it says, Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. So where is the controversy in this? Well, it has to do with the word reckless. It has to do with the word reckless. And and the song um, seems to be making some assumptions about our parable um, that I don't think are accurate nor fits with what what things represent in the parable itself. Uh, it, it, to me, it seems to be making the assumption uh, that it was reckless to leave the 99 in order to go after the one. As if leaving meant the 99 were in some sort of danger because of such. And it's important to understand that the word reckless means to not think or care about the consequences of one's actions, right? To be reckless is to not think or care in regards to one's actions, right? This is why we call it reckless driving, right? Because you're driving in such a way that doesn't care or think about what might happen because of the way that you are driving. Um, And immediately, I think there's a couple issues with this assumption that the 99 were in some sort of danger. We, we've spent the last three weeks talking about the identity between the 1 and the 99. The 99 are the righteous who already find themselves safely in the presence of God. Jesus going after the 1 does not put us in any sort of danger. Especially not in the type of danger that the 1 is in which is in relation to the eternal salvation. The 99 have assurance in their salvation. It tells us this in 1 John. 1 John 5.13. It says, I write these things to you uh, who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Right? Do you believe in the name of the Son of God? then you can know that you have eternal life. There's not some question, there's not some danger for the 99. If they know that they believe in the Son of God, there is no danger. We can have assurance in our salvation. Well, if the 99 in this parable are in danger, maybe the song, maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's not assuming that the 99 are in danger, maybe it's assuming that Jesus is putting himself in danger by going after the one. And we know that in seeking the one that Jesus ended up losing his life. There was great danger. It's true. There was great danger for Jesus. The question becomes, is reckless the correct word to describe Jesus' actions? Again, a reminder, reckless means to not think or care about the consequences of your actions. Was it reckless for Jesus to go to the cross? And the author of the song has come out because of all the stuff surrounding the song. And he said, well, the the word reckless is from the human perspective. It's from our viewing of what Jesus has done. And and I get that. And I I would change it maybe from human perspective to the perspective of the world. And and there's biblical precedence for that. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so absolutely, the world sees the actions of Jesus as some reckless zealot who got himself killed by making too much of a fuss. That's how the world views Jesus. He was reckless and got himself killed. Now, if we're going to talk about the worldly perspective of the actions of Jesus, reckless is an apt word to use. But here's why I still don't want to use it. Because I am not one of those who are perishing. And anybody who is actively worshiping God is not one of those who is perishing, but one who is being saved and should understand the cross as the power of God. Another reason why this matters is because of the purpose in worship. Why do we worship God? 
because he is the only one worthy of lifting songs of praise. This is why many worship songs talk about the amazing different attributes of God, right? If you notice that in worship songs, a lot of times they talk about who God is. Let's talk about the attributes of God, and we call this ascribing to God. We ascribe attributes to God in our praise. This is, you know, the song Awesome God. He is our awesome God. He is a good, good father. Uh, We could go on and on with these worship songs and how they describe who our God is. And so ascribing is the action of attributing something to God. And so, you know, I find it a little uh, ironic that the writer of Reckless Love, he also has a song called Ascribe, right? He understands what that means. And and the words of worship song, uh, the words of a worship song are probably, I don't mean probably, they are the most important part of a worship song. They are the most important part because in singing these words, We are saying, this is who my God is. And so, yes, since I first heard that song, I I can't seem to find comfort in calling our God reckless in worship. Because ever since I've been saved, I see the true power of the cross. Now, again, I'm not going to stop a worship service and be like, how dare you sing this song? (laughs) Uh, you know, I, uh, it's just, it's not that, you know, I don't know. I, that's not what I'm about. But let me get why I wanted to talk about this morning, because this isn't just some random thing that Jed wants to go on some random diatribe. Um, this matters for the series that we're in right now. The suffering that Jesus endured was not without thought or care, but literally quite the opposite. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing, choosing to come to earth as a human. He knew exactly what he was doing. From the very beginning of his ministry, he knew the cross was coming. He even knew before he was on the earth. If we read in Revelation, Revelation 13, 8, it says, all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names, um, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Who was slain from the creation of the world. Jesus knew before creating the world that he was going to have to die for us. Jesus was not reckless. He was not without thought. The thought was the whole point. He was relentless, knowing exactly what was coming. He was relentless. And Jesus has called us to the same. Not to be reckless and go into things without thought, but the opposite. In the previous chapter in Luke, uh, in chapter 14, um, right before Jesus goes into these parables, he has a, a section where he calls on his disciples to count the cost of following him. Count the cost of being a disciple. What is it gonna cost you to be a disciple? And this is the reality that we face. The lost sheep is out in the wilderness. This is not going to be an easy journey, and it's likely going to be one marked with hardship. But we should know this going in. And if you didn't before, you do now. Pursuing your one, pursuing that lost sheep is not going to be easy. My my prayer is, is that you are able to emulate the relentless love of Jesus and despite knowing it's going to be difficult, pursue the one all the same. Despite knowing what's coming, despite knowing there's going to be hard times, to, just, to pursue the one all the same. So, as we look at, let's, let's start talking about the second parable. So that's the first one of the sheep and the shepherd. Let's talk about the second parable with the woman and her coin. And let me ask this question. Have you ever agreed to a job before realizing how much work it was going to take? Right? Have you ever like, yeah, 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 I'll help you, and then you get there and you're like, oh, shoot, that's what we're doing. Okay. <laughs> um, when I was a freshman in high school, uh, there was a guy in our church and he asked if my brother and I would help him paint his house. 
Um, I think, yeah, again, I was a freshman in high school. I don't think I'd even painted a wall at this point. Um, and, and so, yes, yeah, so we show up, and I, you know, I'm ready to start painting, uh, and he hands me a scraper. And it's like, oh, what's that? Like, what, what's that for? Well, yeah, we got to scrape everything. Oh, everything. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I'm looking up, and I, you know, I knew his house was large, but I didn't realize it until you're standing there looking at everything you have to scrape, this big two-story house. Uh, and so, yes, me and my brother had our hand scrapers, and we went around everything. And we scraped this entire two-story house by hand. And so we got done, and I was like, wow, that was a lot of work. That, was, that, that took a lot. Um, and I was like, okay, here we go. Let's, let's start painting. And, and he hands me this can, and I see that it's gray. And I was like, oh, I thought we were painting your house green. And he said, well, we are, but we have to prime it first. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we go through and by hand, with a brush, uh, prime his whole house, top to bottom, two stories, the whole thing. And then after that, then we finally get to actually what I thought we were doing of painting his house. And we painted the house, and, and um, by the end of it, we had worked six 10-hour days to get everything done. And I was like, man, that was not the way I thought this week was going to go. Um, and, and I, you know, there's no hard feelings towards him. He had been very good to me and my brother over the years. And so, um, but you know, like there's something about understanding the work that needs to go into something before getting into it, right? Because when you're into the middle of something and all of a sudden you realize like, oh man, this is not what I thought it was. Um, that's when it's like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore, right? You're sitting there scraping and it's like, I hate this. This is the worst. <laughs> um, and so it's important to understand the work that is going into something before you jump into it. So we get this woman who lost her coin. Here's what it says in, in Luke 15, 8. It says, Or suppose a woman who has ten silver coins and loses one, doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Right? What do we see from this? Pursuing the one is going to be time-consuming, diligent work. It is going to be time-consuming, diligent work. Anymore nowadays, what you see on the internet, um, right, is we all want to have these, these hacks to make things easier. Um, and some of them are good and some of them don't do. Um, you know, one of them that I've actually enjoyed, we have, um, it's the simplest thing, but I love it. Um, we have a, a salt and pepper shaker. And I don't know if you've ever been frustrated by how hard you have to shake pepper shakers to get pepper out sometimes. It's like, get out! Uh, well, our... I've realized that our salt and pepper shaker have a ring of bumps along the bottom, uh, which is fairly common. Maybe you have a set like that. So if you flip your pepper upside down and you take the salt and you rub the two bottoms together, it vibrates and makes the pepper come out all nice and easy. And I saw this and I was like, there's no way. There's no way. And so then I was making eggs one day and I was like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. And so, yeah, sometimes there's hacks like that that it's like, oh, man, that made that job a little bit easier. And then sometimes you have people that are like, hey, just put screws in your tires for traction in the winter. Um, uh, like, no, 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 like, don't, don't do that. Um, I don't know why the bad ones are always, like, car-related. Like, people just really want you to mess up your car, but uh, careful with those. Um, but, right, when things get hard, we like these special secrets to make things easier. Right? We like it when things are easier. And here's what I want to tell you this morning. Here's the special secret for seeking the one. There's no special secret. I have no hacks for you. It's going to be time-consuming and diligent work. That's what it's going to be. And the best thing that I can offer you is know that going in. <laughs> Don't find out in the middle of trying to, man, this is so much more than I thought it was going to be. Please understand now, it's, it's going to be work. It's going to be hard work. It's going to be diligent work. It's going to take time. And so what do we know so far? The road to the one is going to be marked with hardship. It's going to be diligent, time-consuming work. So let's look at our last parable. Let's see what we, it is that we can learn from the journey of seeking the one in the prodigal son. I'm going to start reading in Luke 15, 18. Uh, so this is the son saying, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, 
Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. There's two important aspects I want to talk about with this, and it's, it's the compassion and the running. Our reason for seeking the one should be driven by compassion. That we understand the suffering they are going through because we ourselves were once in, our, in their place. That we seek to love them and not to shame them. And we need to be careful with that because sometimes we take not shaming as not talking about sin. I'm not saying that. Remember, the purpose of seeking the one is to call them to repentance, which may involve addressing sin, but how we go about this should be marked with nothing more than compassion for the person. Now, what's important about the father's running is you can say the speed in which he, he went after the son, but... I think it's more than that because the run, his running, it was uncouth of him. Dignified Jewish men did not run. Running was for boys, not for men. And I bring this up because seeking the one it no, isn't always going to be what's good for our reputation in some people's opinion. And let's not forget that these parables are being told because the Pharisees didn't like who Jesus was spending time with. If we have concern for how the world sees us, it's going to make us less effective in seeking out the one. The most effective path for the father was to run to his son and no amount of etiquette, no amount of cultural faux, uh, faux pas were going to keep him from his son. And so this is what it looks like to go after the one. But as I said in the beginning, we're likely never to say that went exactly how I thought it would. That doesn't mean we can't have an idea of what it will be like. These three parables give us a good understanding of what it might look like. So as, as we round out today, let us count the cost. It's going to be hard. And I don't just mean hard work, even though it will be hard work. What I mean by hard is it's going to hurt sometimes. We are imperfect people seeking imperfect people in an imperfect world. It's going to hurt sometimes. It might be the hurt of your one rejecting the care that you have for them. Maybe you've been there, maybe you know that, that pain. Maybe it's going to be the hurt of others looking differently at you because of who you are spending your time with. Maybe it'll be the hurt of people in your one's life telling lies about you because they don't want you helping this person. I can't predict exactly what it will be, but Jesus said himself in John 16, 33, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. We will find trouble in seeking the one. But take heart, for Jesus has overcome the world. The cost is also not just hard work that may hurt, but diligent, time-consuming work. Our current culture is more and more heading towards the wanting immediate gratification. But seeking the one is not the type of work that we can expect to be quick. It might be quick, but the odds are that we're going to need a large amount of patience. And what's difficult about this is it's not the type of patience of like sitting and waiting some, for something in the mail, right? It's the type of patience, if you've ever had a dog that you had to get burrs out of, right? Have you ever had a dog that you had to get burrs out of? Man, what a miserable task <laughs> for you and the dog. You have to sit there and you have to work diligently because if you get sloppy, you might hurt the dog, and the hard work wears on your patience, but it's needed through the whole process, right? You can't run out of patience as you go through this diligent process. 
And so we have to be diligent in our work seeking the one that we don't get sloppy and hurt them or miss opportunity. And in the midst of the hurt and in the midst of the working diligently, we must do all of this with compassion. To remember what it was like to be lost, to remember the fear that envelops a person without the hope of Jesus in their life. This is the cost of doing the work that Jesus has called us to. This is the cost of seeking the one. And it's important that you understand all of this because we are not called to go searching for one blindly. You're not supposed to do so without thought or care, but completely understanding what the task is going to entail. Completely knowing what the road might look like, we are to walk it anyway. And in this, we follow the path of our Savior who in complete understanding entered Jerusalem on a donkey. As I said in the beginning of the service, knowing exactly what was coming on Friday. He knew the hurt that was coming. Jesus' whole ministry is filled with the diligence of his work. And at the end of the week, as he hung on the cross, one of the things that never left him was the compassion for those he sought the lost. The ones who knew not what they were doing. Us. The ones that Jesus now asks we help him bring home. In full view of what it looks like to seek the one, let us follow our Savior and make the lost found. Will you pray with me? Dear God, I thank you for today. No, we don't know exactly what's going to happen when we go after that one, but we can have an idea of what that road looks like because it looks a lot like the road that Jesus went down. Yes, there's going to be hurt. Yes, There's going to be diligent, time-consuming work that we have to put in. Yes, there's going to be times where it's going to be hard for us to have compassion on people. Where we're going to have temptations of getting caught up in the way that the world thinks about us. But I pray that we emulate the relentless love of your Son, who despite knowing everything that was coming because he knew everything that was coming, went down that road anyway. That he saw after us, that he went to that cross for us. And my prayer is that no matter what that road looks like to the one that we will say, I love that person and I will go after them. I know it might hurt me, I know it's going to be a lot of work. I know I'm going to have to work on my patience and compassion. But this is a life or death situation and I want that lost person to be found. I want them to understand the hope and grace and love that we have in our Savior, Jesus Christ. So give us the courage to do that, God. To walk down that road and to seek that one. It's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Jed. If this is your first time here this morning, first time hearing all this stuff, and you have questions, and you're just thinking to yourself, what now? What does that next step look like? What does it look like to have a relationship with the, with the king of the universe who seeks you with such intent. What does that look like? If this is your first time here today, we want to invite you to just come and have just a quick, you know, hi, hello, chat with Jed and myself in the back of the foyer. We're going to be back there after this last song, and we would love to get to know you and just to, to show you some love, give you a high five, give you a hug. And just know that you're not alone. If you're wrestling with something, if, if you're thinking that, man, I'm not good enough for this. You know, what am I doing here? Just know that you have a place in God's family. 
And so as we close out our service this morning with this final song, it's called Death Was Arrested. And we actually get to, um, I'm hearing rumors that we get to celebrate with a baptism next week as part of our Easter Sunday. And what a wonderful way to be able to sing this song in anticipation of that and also to sing it next week in celebration of that. That we get to come together as a family and be able to say death was arrested and our lives began. Would you sing with me this morning? Would you stand with us as we close out this service this morning with this final song? Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope and no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains My orphan heart was given Morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began For oh, your grace so free washes over me You have made me Your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom. He called me his friend When death was arrested And my life began Oh, your grace so free Washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you It's your Rejoice that though heaven had lost. Here we go. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, no grace so free washes over.
guys. Such an honor to be able to worship with you this morning and just lift a joyful praise to the Lord. We'll see you on Good Friday service again. That is this coming Friday at 6.30 p.m. See you then.